theorizing, the science of nitpicking, deconstructing, and reconstructing plot lines. However, it is not an all-powerful art. It is impossible to create a theory out of nothing. If one wishes to gather evidence for a theory, all arguments of, it's just a movie, bro, must be thrown aside. This is the law of, of course this wasn't what the creator intended, but damn it, we're exploring it anyway. The basis of all theorizing. In accordance with this law, there was a taboo among theorists. Anime. Anime theories are strictly forbidden. For what theory would not anger the diehard fans? Perhaps a theory calculating the worth of a human soul. Nah, that'll probably get people mad too. Welcome to Film Theory, the only show on YouTube that can ruin your childhood faster than a botched attempt at bringing your dead mother back to life. You know, it's been a while since we last talked about Full Metal Alchemist, and a lot has changed in the world of anime since we corrected Ed and Al's biochemistry homework. A brand new season of Attack on Titan has come and gone, My Hero Academia has stolen our hearts, and Naruto has a kid now, apparently? Man, life moves fast. I mean, one moment you're in school, wearing a metal headband, making hand signs, and running around with your hands hands behind your back, even though, scientifically speaking, the drag that creates would only make you slower. And the next, your old buddy Naruto is a dad. Makes you feel kinda old, doesn't it? Makes you kinda worry about the inevitability of death? Well, it's that kind of existential crisis that makes a guy wanna pursue immortality. And anime has plenty of potential solutions. Vampirism, wishing on the Dragon Balls, but it's Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, the 2009 reboot of Full Metal Alchemist that more closely follows the story of the original comics that has the solution to immortality that I want to explore today. Ladies and gentlemen of the internet, strap yourselves in because today it is my goal to calculate the strength of a human soul. And be warned because there are some pretty intense spoilers for FMA Brotherhood up ahead. Nine different characters in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood are functionally immortal. The seven homunculi, artificial humans named after the seven deadly sins, their creator father, and Von Hohenheim, the dear old dad of our two heroes, Edward and Alphonse Elf. Now, all of these characters can, and do, in fact, die in the series, but only when someone goes out of their way to kill them, and even then, it takes a lot of effort. The homunculi are shown to be able to regenerate their entire bodies instantaneously, and without anyone trying to murder them, it's implied that they could live for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. So what's the secret to their impossibly long lives? Well, each of their bodies holds what's known as a Philosopher's Stone, a magical item that amplifies an alchemist's transmutation abilities. The Elric brothers brothers actually find out what it takes to make one of these stones pretty early on in the series, episode 7, but the truth that they uncover is pretty horrifying. The main ingredient for a philosopher's stone is human life. In order to manufacture even a single stone, you have to make multiple human sacrifices. The Philosopher's Stone is people! More specifically, each Philosopher's Stone is made from human souls, sacrificed, extracted, and refined to delicious red liquid. Throughout the series, we see the stone fuel the homunculi's superhuman physical abilities and regenerative powers, and also allow for alchemical transmutations that produce more matter than goes into them. To put it another way, those souls were reduced to mere energy. So what the Philosopher's Stone is, is essentially is a supercharged alchemist battery running on human souls. And if we can figure out how much raw energy that battery stores, we can figure out how much energy each human soul contains, and from there calculate how many human souls it would take to put a few extra hundred years on old Matt Pat's clock. Maybe then I'll finally have time to watch all of One Piece. To figure this out, we're gonna need two things. One, a way of comparing a Philosopher's Stone to a real-world source of energy, and two, a measure of exactly how many human souls the stone contains. For Fortunately for us theorists, FMA Brotherhood gives us the chance to calculate both. In episode 19, one of the homunculi, Lust, stabs Colonel Roy Mustang in the gut and leaves him for dead. Surprise, surprise, Roy actually isn't dead and sneaks up on her later, burning her to death with a broken lighter and a transmutation circle carved into the back of his own hand. She tries to fight back via repeated regenerations, but eventually succumbs to the flames. What a casual viewer might see as one of the most exciting and badass moments of the show is a moment I see as the key to this entire 
vampire theory. As I established in my last episode about Full Metal Alchemist, human bodies in this fictional universe are made of the same stuff as human bodies in our universe. They give us the explicit formula in the show and it matches real life, one for one. So if we can figure out how much energy is contained within a human body, we can extrapolate from there how much energy it would take Lust to regenerate that body after Mustang serves it up extra crispy style. And based on how many times she gets burned before being completely roasted, we can figure out exactly how much energy is contained within her Philosopher's Stone. Then from there, divide by the number of souls in the stone, and voila, we have calculated the amount of energy one human soul contains. Isn't math great? So I'm gonna put a brief pause on this scene and hop over to figuring out how many souls are in Lust's stone. To answer that question, we need to look at the source of the homunculi, Father. A man who looks suspiciously like the Elric's own father, von Hohenheim. The reason for that resemblance, as we learn from the flashback in episode 40, is that Father was originally a homunculus made from Hohenheim's blood back in Xerxes. Xerxes is a legendary kingdom whose population died mysteriously in a single night 400 years before the start of the series. And that little incident happened because Father decided to transmute the entire country's population to make two Philosopher's Stones, one for himself and one to von Hohenheim to repay him for giving him life. And jeez, does that ever make me feel self-conscious about my thank you gifts. I mean, cards? Flowers? Apparently, if I really loved my mom, I'd get her immortality at the hands of countless screaming, tortured souls of a dead civilization. Immortality, the gift that keeps on giving. Literally. Well, I might have spoken too soon. Countless isn't the right word here. I mean, I was worried that I'd have to make estimates based on historical precedents and census data and the few images that we had of the nation of Xerxes, but the anime actually did all the counting for me. It took time, but I managed to learn the name of every last soul. 536,329. The people you trapped inside of me. Which is impossible, just by the way. Dunbar's number, proposed by anthropologist Robin Dunbar, is the theoretical cognitive limit to the number of people with whom a person can maintain a stable relationship. Other anthropologists have pegged this average number to be around 300 based on different factors, but regardless of how many it is, it is a far cry from 536 thousand people. There are limits to how much information the human mind can hold, but I suppose that's not accounting for magically enhanced soul-infused minds, and the show did help me by giving me a hard number to work with, so... I guess I can let it slide this one time. This time, anime. This time. Anyway, his father himself declares in the aftermath of the transmutation, The voices of all the people in this country who were offered in exchange for your immortality well, half of their lives were for me, actually. Which clearly tells us that exactly the same number of souls are trapped inside Father as are trapped inside Hohenheim. Now, we know by watching the anime that Father created the seven homunculi by extracting the seven deadly sins from each of those 500,000 plus souls contained within him. It was all part of a big effort to purge himself of all his negative desires and emotions. But obviously, he still has a lot of those souls left inside. I mean, after all, he's using his own souls to fuel the alchemy of every person in the country. And he's shown to be much more powerful powerful than any of his children. If father purged himself of all those souls' vices, that would obviously leave their virtues. Going by the same biblical principles, just like there are seven deadly sins, pride, envy, gluttony, lust, wrath, greed, and sloth, they're contrasted against the seven heavenly virtues. Faith, hope, charity, fortitude, justice, temperance, and prudence. Not nearly as fun or as exciting. Now, obviously every person is going to have a different amount of each of those traits, but with a large enough sample size, and I'd say five 500,000 is certainly a large enough size, they're likely to all even out at the end. So we can assume that Father Stone is divided 14 ways across 7 sins and 7 virtues. And with Father keeping the virtues, he has 50% of the total souls. That means each homunculus contains exactly 1 14th of the souls that Father started with. Clearly this guy was a bit smarter than Voldemort when it came to dividing up his soul into 7 vessels. As such, we can conclude that Lust's Philosopher's Stone contains about 1 one fourteenth of those 536,329 souls, or about 38,309. Now back to the scene where she dies. We can count that Mustang lit her on fire nine times before she completely turns to ash. So that means each explosion is burning through 38,309 divided by nine, or roughly 4,256 souls with each blast. But now how do we get to the energy contained in each of those souls? Well, the answer lies in how she regenerates. At first glance, you might assume that the homunculi operate like Cell from Dragon Ball Z, who, true to his name, can regenerate his entire body from a 
single cell through replication. But that would make some amount of sense. The energy in the Philosopher's Stone could be used as fuel for rapid cell growth, but it's not consistent with the other ways that we see the stones used throughout the series. Time and time again, we see Philosopher's Stones used by alchemists to add mass to objects, and even change their very nature, turning things like wood into stone or flowers into crystals. New matter just can't come out of nowhere. That would violate the laws of physics. Or in Full Metal Alchemist language, it would violate the law of equivalent exchange. To obtain something of equal value must be lost. So what must be happening here is that the energy inside of the stone is being converted directly into physical matter, in accordance with Einstein's theory of mass energy equivalence. Now if you're not familiar with the most famous scientist ever, well then hey, welcome! You must be new to the theorist family because I talk about this guy a lot. On your way out, make sure you hit that subscribe button to transmute yourself from a viewer to a subscriber. That way you get notified of all the other cool anime related theories that I do on the channel. Anyway, even the loyalist of theorists could probably do with a quick refresher, so aside from his kooky haircut, the thing that Albert Einstein is best known for is proving that matter and energy are actually the same thing. Einstein's most frequently quoted formula, E equals mc squared, is what allows us to convert from one to the other. It's not unlike how alchemists change the form of matter. Going based on the formula, the energy contained in an object is equal to its mass, or weight in kilograms, multiplied by the speed of light in meters per second squared. Now, the speed of light is pretty darn huge, so this formula gives you some pretty crazy big numbers, and it's no accident. It takes an insane amount of energy to hold the atoms of an object together, and when that energy is released, well, that is literally what a nuclear bomb is. Since the Philosopher's Stone is using alchemy to rebuild Lust's body out of pure soul energy, figuring out how much she expends to regenerate is as simple as plugging half her weight into the formula. I say half since only part of her body is getting burned with each of Mustang's blasts. That leaves us to calculate her weight which, honestly, is pretty easy to piece together. Lust doesn't have an official weight, but her official height, according to manga charts, is 5 feet 7 inches. An average healthy weight for a woman that size with a medium frame is 140 pounds or 63 kilograms. And Lust looks, um... She looks, uh... She looks healthy to me. So we'll go with that for our estimates. Plugging in 50% of that weight and then solving the equation gives us an energy equivalent of 2,786,141 terajoules. Now that number probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you, so let me translate. That's the equivalent of about 12 large hydrogen bombs going off. And with that sense, Kim Jong-un suddenly decided to subscribe to the film theorists. Go figure. To get the energy value of one soul, we just divide that by the number of souls lust expends to regenerate. 4,200 156.6, which gives us 654 terajoules per soul, which is the equivalent of about 156 kilotons of TNT, or about 10 times the power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. To put that in perspective, based on the rules of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, you could use the power contained in one soul to create an explosion big enough to destroy half of Manhattan. One soul. So in retrospect, I guess I was a little bit off in my last theory. In addition to all the component elements of a human body they were missing, the Elric brothers were apparently short a few pounds of uranium in their transmutation circle. Which, if you think about it, would have cost them an arm and a leg anyway. Haha, <laughs> you get it? Cause, cause Edward is missing an arm and a leg. What's that supposed to mean? Gee, Ed, it's just an expression. There's no need to get short with me. Damn it, I told you before! Don't call me short! <laughs> Too easy. But all that math still doesn't get us to the immortality that I wanted to get at the beginning of this episode. The energy of one soul obviously isn't enough for eternal life, and with 38,000 souls, the homunculi still die pretty easily, all things considered. If we want to be immortal like Hohenheim and Father, we're gonna need the same amount of energy that they have. To find the energy of all the souls inside Father, we need to multiply the energy of one soul by 536,329, which gives us the whopping number of three. 351 exajoules. That is five times as much electricity as the entire world generates in a single year. Which is a lot of energy, but don't get me wrong, it's still totally attainable. You'd only need about half the world's uranium reserves. And you'd also have to figure out how alchemy works too, I guess, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So there you have it, loyal theorists. We have proven definitively the value of a human soul isn't some magical, unquantifiable thing, but it's still way too rich for my non-immortal blood, so guess I'd start building that dragon radar. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.